Okay. Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 34, Bellhop Etta. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. A big welcome to Tracy Barnett, who is joining us as a guest today. Tracy is here to talk about their game, Iron Edda Accelerated. Welcome to the show, Tracy. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And Sean, you have a mellifluous radio voice. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh. That's why we can't put his face on today. Exactly. It's, it's too much. The, com the combined <laughs> effect would be overkill. Exactly. So after our chat with Tracy, we will be looking at the games we played the previous week. Now, the big thing that happened for Sean and I was Breakout Con, but we're having to save that till next week. Now, besides Breakout, I only got one game to the table, and that was Builders of Blankenberg, including a very cool prototype of a new expansion that hasn't even been announced yet, Fields and Flocks. And I've got a new deck builder, the Cartoon Network. Now, Tracy, you are welcome to stick around and join us for this talk about any games you played in the last week. But if you're done after the interview, we're good to see you go then. Your choice either way. We'll see how my energy levels are looking. <laughs> Sounds right. good. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. We're here for you. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those discussions. Feedback we've received, comments on our content, gaming discussions we've been part of, and so on. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. We've got two comments on our Kickstarter regrets episode. At end of turn on Twitter writes, Porn Armor is the saddest. Actually getting a game that you've hyped so much and then just not playing it because it has standees. Ah, uh, thanks for the comment, end of turn, and I totally agree. That one burns the most, like Torn Armor Hurts. I was really excited about that Kickstarter, and as I mentioned in the episode we talked about, I was personally involved with that Kickstarter, and to have it not turn out, it, it hurts. It, it's bad. Uh, not something I'm happy of being part of at this point. Uh, either way, Chris She writes, My list of non-delivered Kickstarters is a bit longer, but I've gotten some great stuff over the years. I've even received a few things others didn't, like the coolest cooler, because I filed a lawsuit. New York allows me to go after frauds. The only people who have escaped so far are Ken Whitman and John Adams, but I'm patient. Well, thanks, Chris. Interesting about New York law, although I'm surprised Kickstarter failures fall under a fraud given their risk statements. Good for you in getting what you've paid for, though, and I guess living in the state that Kickstarter calls home has its legal advantages. So, Tracy, both these comments go back to our last episode where we talked about Kickstarter regrets. Um, I was wondering, do you have any Kickstarters you regret in some way, either ones you wished you'd backed or ones you wished you hadn't? Uh, it's mostly ones that I that I wish I had backed. Um, and there are so many of them that happen right now. I can't even begin to, like, pull to mind, um, you know, which ones those might be. But like I'm, I'm running like through my list of backed projects, and I don't really see a whole lot that I regret. Primarily because I think that's a pretty wasted emotion. Like <laughs> the money's gone. I back a lot of projects because I want to support the creators, not because I want the thing. Um, so whether or not I've gotten the thing, or whether or not the thing is is great. Like someone's learned a lesson from that and that's worth my, my, my 15 to $40, I guess. So, so yeah, um, not, a, not a ton of Kickstarter regrets over here. Well, that's a good one to have. Now I understand you've been doing some Kickstarter consulting. Uh, are there any games on Kickstarter right now that you'd like to promote that you're involved with? Uh, yes, there, there are. As a matter of fact, the one that is going right now is called cut to the chase. It is a two player action movie chase scene game um and it only takes i mean you can play through a full game in like 20 to 30 minutes 
Um, and that's including creating your own uh, scenarios, your own characters and sort of framing for it. Um, and the it's right there in the chat so you all can see. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really fun game. I really enjoy consulting on the Kickstarter. And it's the kind of thing where so mo in most tabletop RPGs, doing chases is not the best. Like it's mm -hmm. sort of a tacked on kind of thing. And in a lot of cases, especially if it's just a one-on-one -on -one chase, you could take cut of the chase and just drop it into pretty much any game cool. and, and, nice. and run with it. Uh, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I like consulting on Kickstarters because there's a lot less pressure because mm -hmm. um, I'm not responsible for the delivery of everything. I am just responsible for trying to do my best to help it succeed. Absolutely. Very cool. Great. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it onto YouTube. Thanks to our moderator, and she Games. Tonight in the chat, we're looking crowded. We've got Darkling Blight, Major Kayla, Poncho72, Shadzar, where Gators joined us, and of course, the other Tracy is here in the chat room as well as on screen. So today, obviously, we've got Tracy Barnett here. So what I want from you in the chat are questions for Tracy, uh, either about Iron Edda or some of their other games, like School Days or One Shot, or some of their actual play podcasts on the other cast. If you've got a tr question for Tracy, we want to hear it, and we'll get back to that question later in the show. We'll be back checking in with the chat room multiple times throughout the show. Most episodes, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome so, to the guest check-in. Social media works too. Uh, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for questions to come is to come through our website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we're the ones asking the questions. Today, we welcome the other Tracy, Tracy Barnett, to the show. Welcome, Tracy. Thanks for having me. So the main reason Tracy is here is to talk about their new game, Ironetta Accelerated, which was kickstarted back in August 2018 and is already out to backers and should have just hit game store shelves in the last couple of weeks. Now, before we get into Viking Pacific Rim, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, Tracy? Sure. Uh, so like they said, my name is Tracy Barnett. Uh, I am a, uh, non-binary genderqueer tabletop game, uh, game designer. I have been doing, uh, professional game design since 2012 when I wrote and kickstarted my first game school days, uh, which I was lucky enough to win a judge's spotlight any for in 2013. Um, since then I have done seven successful kickstarters. Uh, I have written a bunch of different games. I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Tracy Barnett, and that supports my actual play podcast, The Other Cast. Uh, we just added a new show to that that I do with Kate Bowie, which is called Another Blank Page, where we um, started with a goblin and we just <laughs> described the scene that and a frozen moment in time where that goblin was. And then we identified four things about that scene that we thought we might want to explore later. And effectively it is world building one blank wiki page at a time. So we have links that go to nowhere right now. <laughs> and uh, every episode we're going to pick one of those pages and we're going to explore it. Um, so I do that. I do small games on my Patreon. Uh, I have, Freelance projects in the works with uh, Paizo for their Starfinder line, with uh, Greater Than Games for the Sentinels of the Multiverse RPG, uh, and I have a game in contract that I'm writing for Galileo Games. So I do my best to stay busy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, actually, I don't even I don't even think you mentioned you're a novelist as well. I, I am a, <laughs> a single entry novelist. Uh, yeah, I wrote a, an Iron Edda novel. Uh, that's, that's one of the Kickstarters that I that I successfully did. Um, so yeah, I dabble in fiction as well. Very because, cool. Because because why not have one more thing to do? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
I'm most curious. I got to say, I'm most curious about the Sentinel comics. I got to play that at Breco Con, and oh my god, what a fantastic system! They they took the the greatness that was Marvel Heroic, one of my favorite systems of all time, and distilled it down to so much simpler, quicker, and more storytelling. I, I was extremely impressed by that system. Uh, yeah, so I'm doing adventure writing for that. Cool. Uh, so my assignment for that is the Diamond Book of Monsters, which if you know the Sentinels uh, sort of lore, of which there is a ton, um, there is a uh, a book that is called the Diamond Book of Monsters. And basically it is a collection of information gathered from firsthand accounts of monsters in the setting. Well, okay. in this adventure, it has been stolen. And it is the job of the player characters to write a new one. Um, so that that's that's as much of the pitch as I have at this point in time. Um, I have I haven't had my first like briefing meeting uh, about it, but I'm really excited because the system is amazingly good, and uh, I get to make up a whole bunch of scenarios where you have to go interact with weird stuff in the world like that. That's how how, cool. how cool is that? That sounds fantastic. So to focus things down, uh, I know one of the main reasons you wanted to come on the show and we wanted to talk was that Iron X, Iron Etta Accelerated should be out in stores now, should be available for everyone. Mm -hmm. So what is it? What, what's Iron Etta Accelerated? So Iron Etta Accelerated is the second version of uh, my game, Iron Etta, which originally, the original one was Iron Etta War of Metal and Bone. Um, basically, it is uh, Norse myth meets Pacific Rim uh, where people can bond themselves to the bones of dead giants to use like Mecca. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I, this is the second version because I, uh, I, I see that I'm jumping ahead of question, but it's, sort of all, it, it all gets combined. Um, so I wrote the original version of iron Edda uh, for actually somebody else's Kickstarter back in 2013. Uh, it was called, uh, bones of the earth. It was a stretch goal, uh, for Apotheosis Drive X, which was a fake okay. mecha Kickstarter. Um, so the uh, the reason that I went with, with Bone Mecha was because I had to write a mecha hack for this game, right? Because it, mm -hmm. it was a mecha RPG. Um, and I don't know anime mecha terribly well. Mm -hmm. It's not my wheelhouse. But what I do know is uh, fantasy. And I was playing a lot of Skyrim at the time. Okay. Uh, and so I started thinking about what it would be like if the uh, if the dwarven uh, constructs from from down in the bowels of Skyrim made it up to the surface and what a fight would you know would look like on the surface. And I was like, well, okay, well, how would the humans fight back against that? Dragons were the easy answer, but I didn't want to mm -hmm. do that. Uh, and so I started thinking about the giants, and then some part of me was like, well, you know, living giants are boring. So what about dead ones? What if we did that? And, and that's, that was the genesis of the whole thing. So, uh, I ended up writing a full version of it that I called war of metal and bone and kickstarted it successfully in, uh, 2014 and published the books. I still have a bunch of them in my basement <laughs> and that speaks to sort of the, the issue with it is it was my first really big game. Um, I'd done school days and one shot by that point in time, but I hadn't done a full fledged game book. And even this one didn't include all the fate rules in the book um, okay. because because fate core is a pretty big tome, right? It's like 320 yeah. pages at six by nine on its own. Um, so the, the the prevalent thinking at the time was don't try and put all the rules for fate into the book because it'll just bloat it and you'll be writing so much. So I didn't. Um, and there were a lot of mistakes I made along the way. And I I didn't really have a, a chance nor the focus nor anything that I needed to really make sure that game was a success. But I knew the idea was good. Um, every time that I ran it at a convention, people responded to it really well. I was able to hand sell copies to people after they played it. Um, I, I knew that there was something more that could be done with it. So I took a chance and two years ago I reached out to encoded designs. Um, cause I knew some of the folks there because I write for gnome stew as well. Um, and pitched them the idea of a new version of Ironetta. And I knew it needed to be something, something more than just 
war of metal and bone with the warts taken care of. Um, and I'd been playing Dresden files accelerated, uh, at the time, um, that release of fate accelerated is probably some of the best game tech. If you like fate, uh, that I've ever seen. And so the, I using that framework, using conditions and using, um, you know, stunts that trigger conditions and coming up with basically classes in a fate game was exactly what iron Ed had needed. Um, so it took all the stuff that was sort of like wishy-washy and loosey goosey in the, in the first version, like you can summon your giant whenever you want and you have, you have a giant. Oh, I bet that's mm-hmm. scary. Like that's what it amounted to. Right. Um, and in iron Ed accelerated, you check a box of a condition to summon the bones. Mm-hmm. That's great to get those boxes back. You have to indulge in your giant's worldly desire because you have a, an active spirit living in your head. And it misses something about being alive. And so everything has teeth now. Like there's a price for the powers that you can use. And I think that that really makes the game resonate a whole lot more. Um, So that's that's the reason for the new edition. I'm really glad that Encoded uh, took a chance on me uh, because I'm really, really proud of this new version of the game. I think it, it's the version of the game I wanted to write in the first place that there's no way I would have known how to write it. And I don't think you often get a chance to do that again. So I'm glad that I did. Excellent. Now, I noticed in your first version of the Ironetta uh, Kickstarter, your stretch goals were um, <laughs> imp- implementing the world in other systems. Uh-huh. And so spreading yourself out using other other authors, I guess, for the most part. I don't know if any, if any of those were, were going to be yours. Uh, and you've now gone in a different direction. You've added more art and more to your core sort of core game. Um, was there something about that first experience that caused this shift? Or are you just looking to, to have a different Kickstarter experience? Uh, well, one, I wasn't running this second Kickstarter. Uh, and that's a big difference. Encoded was in charge of all of the all of the details of the Kickstarter. Okay. Um, we talked about some of the stuff and what what the stretch goals were going to be. Um, with the first Kickstarter, I definitely uh, my reach exceeded my grasp. Right. Like I knew how cool the idea was, and I and I still believe this to a large degree. Um, whenever any group sits down with a game as soon as they start playing that game, that game belongs to the group of people playing it and not the author. Fair. Like, and that as as, it's like, everything's perfect until first contact. Right. Mm -hmm. And then as soon, as soon as people start feeding their own stuff into the setting or even the system, it's different. Like no two groups play D and D in exactly the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no two versions of the forgotten realms are the same forgotten realms. So my idea with all those different stretch goals was, well, what if I take that to what I saw as its logical conclusion? Like, let me get talented people who like the core conceits of what Ironetta is and that there is a Ragnarok happening with giant bone mecha fighting dwarven mm-hmm. destroyers. Uh, you are going to create your starting place using a series of questions and everyone will belong to one of nine warrior clans. Like those were, those, those were the things, the pillars that make Ironetta Ironetta and then just let them run with it in other systems that they know. Well, that was the, that was the whole intent behind that. And so if I had really wanted that to like succeed, I probably could have structured it differently in terms of what stretch goals came first um, like I probably would have put Pathfinder front and center, right. for right. example, um, at the time. Um, and there are still some of those folks who have those ideas and are tinkering with them. Um, like one was a far future thing where the bone bonded that are actually the pilots of ships that they're bound to out in space. Interesting. Right. And one was a very much Pacific Rim where the uh, the dwarves rose up like kaiju from the ground, you know, from the oceans and Mm -hmm. and whatnot. So I wanted to see what those expressions were like, because I wanted to see what people would do with the thing that I came up with. Um, and that's not to say that, that, that I could never do that again. Like the original war of metal and bone is published under a creative commons license, like tip to toe. 
Mm-hmm. So that's still available for anyone to use as they see fit. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, it was, it was a lot. I think I had stretch goals planned up to a hundred thousand dollars. Cause uh, I, I think actually 115, I think it was, yeah, uh, <laughs> cause, because you know, um, <laughs> Hey, go big or go home. Right. Yeah, you know, I guess, I guess so. Um, it seems really arrogant to me now when I think <laughs> about it. Um, but at the same time, I also, um, I think it's okay to assume that you're going to be successful if you have something that you believe in, um, to have it be that successful. That was probably a lot of hubris, but, um, I guess I'm, even though it never happened, I'm okay with having planned for it too, because I didn't want to be so successful that I failed. Um, I failed for different reasons, which is fine, but you know, and failure is when, when your failure is that you have a bunch of books in your basement that didn't sell, like that's still a kind of success. Like yeah, I still yeah. made a thing, yep. you know? True. So, so coming from a more old school RPG background, uh, QCC last year was my first foray into modern story-based gaming, uh, with both, uh, powered by the apocalypse and fate accelerated. Uh, now, I found personally more of a connection with Fate, or at least your implementation of Fate Accelerated through Ironetta, uh, than I did with Powered by the Apocalypse. Uh, you know, as, as much as much as I love Phil, um, I, I connected somehow more through through your game. What led you to choose the Fate Accelerated over the other systems? You know, even at, at back at the original. I mean, I think we know why you've gone to to Fate Accelerated now with Dresden. But originally, what was your uh, what what started you off? Well, it was a stretch goal for a fate RPG originally. So right. like I had to write it for fate to start with, but there was nothing that <laughs> kept me, but there's nothing that kept me there right. aside from the fact mm-hmm. that fate is probably the system that resonates with me the most. Um, there's something about the way the aspects interact with the mechanics and the way that you can mechanize bits of story through aspects that just sings to me. Um, if you're not familiar with fate and you've played D and D five E your, uh, personality traits, your ideals, your flaws, your bonds, those are almost aspects. Like they yeah. are, they are so close to being aspects that all you'd really have to do is allow your characters to have more than one point of inspiration. And for them to spend it, they would have to actually reference which of their personality traits is helping them in that situation. Then it would be an aspect like that. That's right. it. Um, and so I was happy to see D&D go that direction because mm-hmm. that tech just – it just works for me. It right. speaks to the way that I see stories. It speaks to the ways in which I like to have players um, have agency and take narrative control over something right. and say, no, it's because of this environmental thing that I created or because of who I am that I succeed at this action. Um, that was really, really good for me. And the addition of the the addition of the conditions in Ironet or in Fate Accelerated or in Dresden Accelerated just it's 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 the sauce that just makes all of this work together Makes even sense. better because Fate as written, Fate Core, Fate Accelerated are very open ended, right? You have to set your own narrative boundaries for what is going to take place and, and set your own fictional constraints, right? You say, okay, well, everyone in this setting can fly. Cool. In our game, everyone mm-hmm. can fly. So when you're talking about moving from one zone to another, it's easy enough to assume flight. But that can take a lot of work, right? Because you're essentially defining an entire campaign setting or game, you know, if, if that's the place where you're starting with, with fake horror. Um, by taking a setting and first of all, expressing it through all the questions that you answer for hold fast creation, because everyone at the table gets a chance to buy in and answer a question and contribute Mm. something, (coughs) excuse me, contribute something to the setting that is like a plot hook that the GM will then use for your one shot or your campaign. Mm. That gets you initially invested. And War of Metal and Bone had that, and it was really, really good. But then, because of the ways that conditions work, 
when I say that, for example, the Scald, the Bard type character, um, if they betray somebody, they are now outcast. Like, well, what does that mean? Um, so it means one thing mechanically, and it also means that this is the kind of society that has social mm-hmm. norms that you don't deviate from. Same thing with the bone bonded. You can summon the bones a certain number of times, and then if you go about things the wrong way or don't indulge in the giant's worldly desire, the giant is running around in your body for a little bit, and mm-hmm. everybody knows it. So I got to take bits of the setting – and the tone for the setting that I knew came across when I was running sessions of the original one, and I got to bake it into these these destinies. Right. And I got to give you something where I can put a seer or a rune scribed or a bone bonded or the leader or the scald or the bandit down in front of a player, and they can read through the powers and they know what kind of character this is. And then they get to make it their own with the aspects and by assigning their mm-hmm. approaches and, and choosing the stunts. So it just oozes the flavor of the setting without putting the constraint on you of this is what the narrative will be because that's in the player's hands. Right. And I think that um, some games of, that are powered by the apocalypse – because of the way that the dice always trend toward mixed successes Mm -hmm. and in a game like apocalypse world, the way the game is written, there's no way out of the post apocalyptic nightmare unless you either die or your character is retired. That's the only way you're safe from the GM like that's, or the MC, I should say. Um, and that ethos kind of carries through. Like if you keep a character around, yeah, they'll advance, yeah, they'll get more stuff, but there, there's never a moment where that can't be threatened or taken away from them. Mm-hmm. There's no way to wrap up that story in a nice right. way. And that's the intent of the game. Right. But in a campaign of Ironetta, you could do that the same way everyone can ride off into the sunset in a Western or, you know, you can all retire to your manor house in D and D. Um, so it has some old school fantasy, like there's wild, ridiculous stuff going on in the world mixed with a lot of current modern gaming tech that asks the players to really buy in and contribute. Now you mentioned Holdfast Creation. Can you expand on that a bit for people who haven't seen or played the game? Sure. Um, so your Holdfast is your starting settlement, right? It is where everyone lives, and it is where the plot happens. Um, and the uh, the way that it works is that everyone uh, rolls some dice, and they get a, a question that they have to answer as a player. Um, and it could be something as simple as a vital resources run out near the hold fast. What is it? And, um, how are you going to get it back? Right. That's a paraphrase of, of one of the questions, or it could be something like the Jarl has been killed. Who murdered the Jarl mm-hmm. and why has nobody caught them yet? Right. And so you get to have the players feed into the setting in real tangible ways. Um, it's the kind of thing that happens in a lot of games, but it's very prescribed at the beginning of this. Like everyone answers a question and that ensures that everyone has a say in what this story is going to be like. And everyone, you can, you can ask, you know, opinions of other people at the table while you're answering the questions if you want to. Um, but the other thing that it does is it gives you hooks to tie your character into when you go to character creation. Um, so for those of you watching, um, I think both Mo and Sean uh, played at, at QCC, and I think they can tell you that oh, – sorry, I, my train of thought just <laughs> veered sideways. No problem. Um, uh, when I run at a convention, we do hold fast in character creation mm-hmm. as part of gameplay, and then we play the session that we just created. Which I think um, is important. Yeah. For this kind of game, it definitely is. 
Now, the characters are mostly pre-generated, like we had to add the aspects and then put the approaches in, and you can even leave the stunts off to the side if you want yep. to. Um, it's fine. But getting to answer the hold fast questions and generating the space in which you want to play and then looking at the character options and going, oh, I want to play the shield bearer because they were totally the ones who let the Yarl get killed in battle. Right. Like, you can make those connections so easily, and right. it really resonates with people. Yeah, you can definitely see that. Um, <laughs> to tie that to something that happened this weekend, I played a game of Tales from the Loop. Fantastic game. Fantastic GM. I've now played the game twice. Playing it this time just wasn't as good as the time before. And Sean and I were sitting there the last day of the con talking about it, going, I don't know why, because I loved it the first time. And the DM was fantastic. The story was fantastic. The characters were good. And what we determined the difference was the first time we played Fails from the Loop, we did that setup at the beginning. The mm -hmm. GM had us decide what our hideout was and said, started us off with something absolutely horrible happened last year that you don't talk about. What is it? And then we all talked about how we hide that fact. Now, all that was missing from the game we played this weekend. This weekend, it was, here's your pre-generated character who already has all the bonds and all the ties to all the other characters already established. And they all made sense, and it, it seemed like a logical thing. But being told that, yeah, you your hideout is a military base at the outside of the town, and you all discovered a baby dinosaur together, wasn't the same as sitting there going, oh, my God, something horrible happened last year. What was it? Mm -hmm. And just having that buy-in in the beginning literally changed the overall feel of the entire game. And instead, like, I had a good experience. We played a good game. The DM was great. The other players were great. But I didn't feel connected to it at all. It felt like I played a con game. The con game's done. That was fine. Whereas the game we played at QCC, I went and bought a copy of Tales from the Loop immediately after because I'm like, that was a fantastic experience. Yeah. And that was the difference. Was it just that buy-in at the beginning, how important that it can be? Yeah, and I think especially at a convention yeah. where you've got three to four hours to have a good time with everybody. You need something that gets player buy-in right away, right away. Yeah. or you, you'll end up with traditional games where like, okay, here's your character, here's your scenario, let's go. And those can be a lot of fun, yeah. but I think that there's a special magic that happens when you get players to buy into what's going mm -hmm. on. Now, that can be a lot of pressure on players. I know that yeah. for sure, and I do my best to help uh, ease people into it if they're new to it because mm -hmm. um, I get it like that kind of gaming is my bread and butter now um, mm -hmm. I don't ever prep anything for a con session of Ironetta I take my pre-gens and I set them down on mm -hmm. the table and I wait for players to give me story and then we play that story because mm -hmm. I've now been doing it for five years so like it's it's just like yeah. second nature to me, but it's not second nature to players always, um, yeah. especially if they're not familiar with fate, which is a whole other thing to learn as well. Mm -hmm. So, and that can be a lot of cognitive load, and I try and make it as easy as possible. Um, I also made sure when I wrote Iron Edit Accelerated that I took as much of how I run the game at the table and put it into the book as I possibly could. Because I did not do that well enough in the original one. Right. Um, and it's one thing to be able to say, yeah, the game works great when I run it. Yeah. You yeah. know, <laughs> <laughs> but you kind of have to make it sure that everyone can have a good experience. Yep. And that's that's a different kind of beast. And that goes right into some of the discussions we've been having recently about manuals where, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to a board game, uh, if the board game is only great when the designer plays it with you. You know, you've got to you've got to do some work on your manual, and I think that's it's very this very much the same thing in an RPG game with uh, making sure the designer infuses themselves into that uh, into that book game book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty necessary. So earlier you mentioned you worked with the Encoded Design team. Now I got to admit I'm I'm a I'm a fanboy. Uh, I will go that far to say that of that group of people and the work they've been doing uh, in the industry. So how was it working with Senda, Phil, Chris, and the rest of the Encoded team? Um, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Encoded is a great group of people to work with. Uh, Phil is a project manager by by trade, um, mm -hmm. and so having him head up that project meant I always knew what was coming when right. what I had to do when 
all that good stuff. Um, Chris was a really good developer uh, for this. He asked a lot of good questions about the setting and how I was presenting information. Um, and um, uh, Bob did a great job with the edit, um, making sure that that my words were not a slurry of, <laughs> of ridiculousness. So, yeah, I mean, I would happily uh, work with them again. I was very, very pleased with how everything went. Good to hear. Very good to hear. Right. So, drift, drifting back again towards uh, Ironetta and what, mm-hmm. where, where it came from for you, uh, I saw in some of your notes you mentioned uh, Vikings was just starting on TV at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, and you and you also mentioned earlier Skyrim was uh, you were playing a lot of that. Is that so? Yeah. Where where did what what about it? Uh, you know Ragnarok and and that sort of concept. Where did that come from? And where you know how did how did it, this all come about? Um, so I think for me, when it comes to Norse myth, Ragnarok is the most compelling story, right? It's the, it's the end of all things. It's, it's the Fimble winter, the eternal, uh, snow, the, the twilight of the gods, brother versus brother and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think it's always best when it is changed and subverted a little bit and put into a modern context. Or a context that 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 resonates. Um, mm-hmm. Look at Thor Ragnarok, right? Like it has a lot of Norse myth in there. Mm-hmm. Surtur, the giant who is going to you know strike down Asgard, and um, you know uh, Fenrir, the the wolf. Um, but they they changed enough of it to make it part of that setting and to make it good and compelling. One of my favorite movies uh, is Thor Ragnarok. Um, so there was just sort of like on the initial conception of the idea of why would the dwarves be attacking and what would be fighting them back? Ragnarok was like the natural backdrop for me for that, because it means the upending of all things, of all traditions, of all mores by which people operate socially speaking, and so that let me go, okay, so what we think of when we watch the show Vikings, right? Like, what's that like if someone is now bound to the bones of a dead giant? Like, how is that upended? How are those traditions, that honor-based system, the clan-based system, how is all of that changed because of this Ragnarok that no one expected? Um, so when I was doing the initial writing for War of Metal and Bone, I watched a lot of Vikings on History Channel. Um, I believe I live tweeted most episodes. <laughs> um, and I also did a lot of research on Vikings. Uh, I, I read a bunch of books uh, to figure out how their society worked, because that way I could turn it on its ear and make it my version of, of Ragnarok. Um, the other aspect to it is that um, I am about as white as they come. <laughs> and Norse mythology is a mythology that I can use without appropriating somebody else's culture. Fair. It has worked its way into so much of the fantasy myth that we know. Uh, for example, in The Hobbit, the names of all the dwarves. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thor and Oakenshield notwithstanding, those names are from the poetic Edda. Like, legit. When the Edda rattles off names of dwarves, it's Owen, Glowen, Ori, Nori, Dori, Biffer, Boffer, Feely, Ke- like they're named mm-hmm. dwarves in Norse myth. Right. And Tolkien was just like, yep, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. um, he ripped off a lot of Norse myth for all of Middle-earth. I mean, a ton of it. So... It was already integrated in a lot of ways. Um, the other thing is that I think there are a lot of... I'll, I'll be more polite than they probably deserve and say socio-political groups who cling to mm-hmm. Norse myth for a lot of really unsavory and uh, lousy reasons. And I don't think they deserve to keep it. Fair. Um, so I wanted to make something that was that had the the vibrancy of Norse myth that it has for me, these stories that, that resonate. They're so human. The gods are so fallible. 
they they walk among people like their their hubris and their arrogance we see on everybody and they're also ridiculously funny and strange um like to make sure that the walls of asgard could get built loki turned into a female horse and tempted a giant stallion away <laughs> and then got pregnant and by the way gave birth to a nine-legged horse which or an eight-legged Slipner. horse it was which became odin's mount like mm-hmm. that's that's, that's wild. Yes. I, like, think about that in the modern context. Uh, Loki is a is a gender fluid weirdo, and I love it. Um, so a lot of the the things that are important to me societally right now, um, uh, sexual equality, gender equality, uh, being a gender fluid person myself, like Norse myth has a natural home in that because it was a very egalitarian society, like. As long as you could do the job, it didn't matter what parts you had. It didn't nice. matter what you looked like. There were there were black Vikings, like mm-hmm. even if and they did have slavery practices, which I don't agree with, obviously. But like, it wasn't born a slave, always a slave. Right. You could not be a thrall anymore just by being awesome. And that didn't mean that there weren't lousy people in the society, but like. I don't, I don't idealize it, and I don't idolize what they had. But a lot of the components of the, of the society they had are fertile ground for the kinds of stories that I want to tell. And so it, that was a natural choice in ways that I don't think I could have done with like a Christianized England. Right. Um, this isn't King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Um, you know what I mean? Or, um, even other European, uh, story traditions like Norse mythology just made sense to me. Yep. Now with all this Norse, uh, you've got a lot of Norse, uh, words, uh, littered throughout your, your book. Now I, I haven't seen a copy of uh, the accelerated version, but, uh, I know there's no pronunciation guide in the original uh, have you right. included one in the in the other, or are you just letting people uh, sink or swim? I'm letting people sink or swim because I made a um, a very uh, distinct choice when I wrote uh, both games, in that I did not use any of the diacritical markings like umlauts or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also did not use any of the um, the dead characters, like the Thorn character, for example. Um, I know to a degree, I have not studied the language enough to, to even claim uh, proficiency, Fair. but I know how a lot of those things are pronounced. I know that the Thorn is th, and I know that the character that appears in Odin's name, which is like the little O with a tall tail and a little cross on it turned sideways, mm-hmm. is... Um, also can pre- be pronounced the, but in a different way. So Odin's original name was Othin, right? And there are a lot of other things that can stem off of that. But I wanted, I wanted to have Anglo- Anglicized, if I said that right at all, versions of the names that would let you get the feel and the flavor of it without requiring you to speak Old Norse. Okay. Um, and so if I use the word Draugr, right? You can see it. Okay, there's an R on the end. There's no E in front of it. Hmm, maybe I just shortened that R sound a little bit, and that's what comes out of your mouth. Um, but the other thing is, again, it's almost like the play style for any given table. I don't care how you pronounce that stuff at your table. Mm. It does not have any bearing on the quality of gameplay experience that you're going to have. Yeah. <coughs> and it makes no sense for me to be prescriptive about that stuff. When as long as within your group at your table, when you communicate, it's understood what is meant, you're fine. Fair. So moving away from Iron Edda for a little bit, I know one of the things you are very actively involved in is podcasting. Now, I personally do subscribe to the other cast. I really have been enjoying the Iron Edda actual play. Uh, though the favorite, my favorite thing that you've done so far has to be gas bound with the soccer dads. Uh, <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, can you tell us more about the other cast and what you're doing there? Uh, sure. So 
I started the other cast about two years ago because um, I was in a really dark place at the time and was feeling very creatively stunted and like I wasn't like I wasn't getting a whole lot accomplished. And um, my group of friends and I, that I play with and I they've been comfortable for a little while with me putting down a voice recorder while we play. Um, I used an old actually I think I have it. Yeah, I have it right next to me here. I used an old uh, Olympus oh, yeah. hand, yeah. handheld digital voice recorder for yeah. the for the longest time because there's a podcast that I used to listen to called The Gamer's Haven, mm-hmm. and they recorded actual play using very similar models to this, um, and they would put up unedited audio. I even helped them with their gaming convention for a few years out in Kansas nice. City. Um, so... We had started playing a Star Wars game back in September. It would have been of 2016. Yes. Um, and I had just put down the voice recorder sort of as a matter of course. Didn't know if I was going to do anything with the audio or not. But I was like, well, let's just make sure we've got it. Why not? Uh, and then like January or February of, of 2017, um, I didn't feel great. I didn't feel good about what I was doing. And my usual, uh, which I'm trying to get better about, but my usual MO when I feel that way is to take on a new project. (laughs) Um, So I already was paying for uh, the Adobe Creative Suite um, because I was using Photoshop. And so I had Adobe Audition, this audio editing software. And I was like, well, what if I like just took this Star Wars game and actually edited it down into a half hour, you know, you know, half hour episodes. And so I just started doing it and I found this really amazing creative fulfillment from it because when you edit a podcast, you edit the audio, you put the stuff at the beginning or the end or in the middle, wherever you're putting extra stuff. And then it's done. It is so different from writing because writing you write a draft, you give it to someone to read it, they read it, you make changes, you play test it, you find things to change, you give it to your editor, they edit it, there are things you need to change. And even then, once you turn it in and you're done, the final product isn't in your hands until months later. And so it's a very long, drawn-out process. Um so I, I really enjoyed that. And um, I, of course, did the thing that I always do. And I added uh, too much too fast and mm-hmm. ended up with a Star Wars game, a uh, fate-based Dungeons & Dragons style game, and then an actual Dungeons & Dragons style game on there. And I was editing three half-hour shows a week. Ooh. Uh-huh. I don't quite know how I did it at the time, <laughs> but um, I, I did it for a while. And then I started to get burned out, um, and I brought in one of my players as an editor for one of the shows, and I'm very grateful to Jared for having done that. Um, And now I have another full-time editor uh, who does all the actual play editing, so Rob uh, Abrazzato is my my actual play editor, um, for which I am eternally grateful um, and we've cut things down now. So we we played a Dresden Files campaign. We played an Ironetta campaign. Jared edited that for me. We have picked up our D and D game, the Zachar Span game. We are actually going to finish it. Um, we have we have anywhere between two and four sessions of it left, but we're actually going to wrap all of it up, which is going to be awesome. Um, and we're on the verge of launching the next actual play series which is a water deep dragon heist uh game that is called water deep for a few dragons more (laughs) um yeah uh so rob's editing that uh i am doing uh a new intro segment for it uh that is water deep public radio (laughs) so every episode will kick off with a water deep public radio segment that serves as a recap for the previous episode um and uh, I feel a little self-conscious about this because you you all are actually much closer to the to the region that this voice comes from than I am. Um, but every time I went to do 
like to just our sort of practice what that voice would sound like as the as the radio announcer for this public radio thing. Well, you know, it always came out like this, and there's a fresh Indian breeze coming right off the bay there, <laughs> and you're just going to want to make sure that you watch out for those manta rays down there because they'll pull you straight nice. down. They will, right? <laughs> and so that's the voice that started coming out of my mouth. So that's that's the voice of the of the radio host for Waterdeep Public Radio. Um, Very nice. <laughs> so. Uh, so yeah, it's it's good. Um, it got to be a lot. It's now going to be once Sacro Span wraps up, it'll be one actual play series, uh, and now another uh, show called um, another blank page, which I talked about at the top of the at the top of the episode that I'm doing with Kate Bowie. Um, that will let me do nice diverse things, uh, but it will keep things manageable. So. So yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So speaking of the other cast, I've got a question from Twitter from the Regal Beagle. I That's know you do. JK <laughs> Terez, who says, "Who is your favorite member on the other cast?" Asking for a friend. Also, what is the correct way to space and capitalize the other cast? Um, so that's one of my players. <laughs> that was my guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's Jeff. Uh, Jeff played um, Eve Everest Mo- or Everest Eve Montgomery in um, the Dresden Files game. Um, plays uh, Cora in Zachary Span, uh, and will be uh, Prophet Jack uh, is the name of his character in uh, For a Few Dragons More, um, and. I'm going to get real close to the mic just in case he's listening. <laughs> Jeff, I love all of you equally. Um, uh, and the, the, the last bit. Um, yeah, he was just doing that to be, to be himself whom I love uh, <laughs> as much as I love my other players. Uh, Cause I already said that. Um, but the, that actually um, stems back around to my online handle and why it's the other Tracy. Uh, so back Oh, in 2012, 2013, um, I had a different uh, Twitter handle. And uh, there was a podcast that had just started that had the same name as it. And I was getting like cross traffic from that. And okay. it, started to, it started to really bug me. And I was like, well, fine, I'm just going to change it. What should it be? And uh, at the time, there were two Tracy's in tabletop role playing games that I would have counted as better known than me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tracy Hickman of Dragonlance fame uh, and Tracy Hurley, uh, Sarah Dark Magic, who at yeah. the time was was writing a lot of 4E articles mm-hmm. and such on the Watsi website. And so I was like, well, fine. They're better known than me. And I was being really bratty about it in my head. Um, I'm going to be the other Tracy. <laughs> right. And and so I just changed my handle, but it became it became a brand for me. Yeah. Right. Like no matter what totally. your frame of reference, no, no matter what your frame of reference is, I'm the other Tracy. Mm-hmm. Right. And if I'm doing design work on my own, I call it the, um, from the other dev productions, um, the other cast. Right. And yeah. now it's it's just a thing that um, I, it's become identifiable for me. Oh, right. And and I don't it was a few people early on. um we're like, well, doesn't that sort of minimize you? Doesn't that like, you know, put you out? And I was like, no, because I'm always around, right? Like you can bring up whatever other, whatever Tracy you want. I'm the other one. Right. I'm yeah. the one you remember. <laughs> there you go. So, so yeah, it just, it, uh, it worked for me. Um, and so the correct spelling and spacing is capital, the capital, other capital cast all jammed together with no spaces. There you go. There we go. All right. Well, that's all the questions that Mo and I have. Time for us to check with those here live in the lobby, our chat room, and hear some of the questions that they had for you. Now, Weregator starts off with, what is your favorite thing about Ironetta? I know that's like asking about your favorite child, maybe, but... <laughs> um, my favorite thing about Ironetta is how it gets gamers of all different backgrounds and all different... I mean that both personal backgrounds and backgrounds in gaming. Mm -hmm. It gets everyone engaged and playing so well. Like the ideas of what it can be are universal enough that I rarely have to explain a whole lot of 
what's going on. I will have to define some terms sometimes, right? Cause there's mm-hmm. some setting, some setting specific stuff, but it really just gets people interested and engaged. And specifically the way that I run fate, which is also like, I tried, like I said before, I tried to really include that in the book. Um, it gets people interested in the system and, and the game and it can, uh, it can really work out well. Um, like the, when I, when I think of that specifically, like at a, a catacon a couple of years ago, where Gator got to play a mm-hmm. quick, a quick demo session of it with me, uh, with Darcy Ross, who had never played a fake game that sort of like clicked for her. Right. And by the time we finished the, we only had like half an hour or 45 minutes. We blazed through hold fast and character creation. And we actually played a quick session. And by the time we were done, she was like, now I get it. Right. That doesn't mean it became her favorite system, obviously, but the way that I run this is going to sound away, but that's okay. I'm going to let it ride. The way that I run fate helps people understand how fate works. Oh, trust um, me. I understand. Yeah. It was the same thing for me. Mo, Mo had that very exact same experience. I remember, <laughs> yeah. I remember the, cause you, I mean, Mo has had the book, the, the fate book for, for ages and it had never really clicked in. And I remember yeah. that moment and, and that gleam in his eye when, when, while playing your game, it, mm-hmm. it, it hit him. <laughs> yeah, it was you explaining um, how things are both mechanically and narratively true having to do with the room being on fire was mm-hmm. the exact moment. I'm like, there, now now I get it. Because I had read Spirit of the Century. I bought Dresden, the original Dresden Files Fate game. Um, actually, my first experience with Fate was Base Raiders, of all games. Mm-hmm. And just none of them, like, it, I get it, but I didn't get it until playing right. so. I think you're you're one of the best fate ambassadors out there so far. It seems <laughs> if you converted Darcy too, I, I can't compete with her. <laughs> well, and and I learned how to play from Morgan Ellis, who is one of the best fate GMs that you will ever care to meet. If you ever see his name on a menu at Games on Demand, okay. you need to play a game with him. Sounds good. So I've got a question from uh, Deanna. Uh, who is uh, quite a bit of a bibliophile. So she wants to know if there were any particular books on Norse culture or myth that inspired you to create Iron Edda, specific books. Um, so I'm actually, I'm looking up at my at my shelves here, and there is a book called The History, uh, or A History of the Vikings by uh, Gwyn Jones. And it just happened to be like what I could find at half price books at the time, <laughs> but it was a really, really valuable resource. Um, it, it just detailed so many things so well and it's, it's readable, it's approachable. Um, and then I have a copy of a book called the Norse myths, uh, that is, uh, by, uh, Kevin Crossley Holland. Um, I've since uh, really fallen in love with the um, the Neil Gaiman uh, book of Norse myths. I really like his ad- his adaptation of it. Um, and then, honestly, just reading the poetic and prose eddas online, um, you can find translations of those for free nice. uh, online. And so, the uh, one of the first concrete bits of writing that I did for any version of Ironetta was the poem that's found at the front of uh, War of Metal and Bone and also Ironetta Accelerated. I was, it was edited a little bit for Ironetta Accelerated, but um, I was visiting friends in the Washington, D.C. area, and I was sitting on their basement with my phone in my hand like... I had a creative moment and I needed to like get something out. And I wrote most of that poem there. Uh, and I wanted to write it in the style of the poetic Edda. And there was this refrain that I kept seeing in some of the stanzas that was, would you yet know more? Right. Like the, almost a warning from the, from the author, like I'm about to tell you about, the history of the world. I'm about to reveal the deepest secrets of reality to you. I'm going to talk to you about Ragnarok. I'm going to talk to you about the gods. I'm going to talk to you about their lives and how they impacted our world. Are you sure you want to know? Are you sure you're ready for this? And it nice. like, so that, that really resonated with me. So a lot of the stanzas at the end of that end with that phrase, would you yet know more? Cause I think that's a really in a phrase that really invites exploration. Mm-hmm. Um, 
um, I also read uh, a little bit about uh, Vinland, uh, which was the the Viking name for the the New World uh, for North America, because mm-hmm. um, there was a Viking colony uh, on Vinland, and that gave me a sense of sort of like the scope of of what as a culture they were capable of. Right. Um, and even though Vinland did not survive, um, it was still. I got to thinking about like alternate histories and what would have happened if, and so on and so forth. And I think that that's really useful thinking when you're talking about uh, a fantasy game setting, which is in and of itself an alternate, not real kind of hist- a, a historical historical thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we got another question here from Where Gator. Uh, he's run Ironetta, but had some d- issue dealing with scale differences. So. How do you suggest uh, a DM run those scale differences, or do the bone bonded just win all conflicts against a human scale? Um, they definitely can. That's kind of it, it's it's the Harry Dresden problem, right? And that's and the scale system uh, in Iron Edit Accelerated is adapted from the one in Dresden Files Accelerated, where the archetypes are not balanced against one another. There are things in the world that are just more powerful. Uh, and bone bonded are one of them. However, there are some the the balancing factors <clears throat> that exist for the the powerful destinies are sort of baked into what the destinies are. So if you have a player who is really like min maxing everything and wants to never have the giant take control and always wants to like they can just indulge in the giant's worldly desire and always have boxes available. It's your job as the GM to make that not punitive, but like you need to illustrate exactly when when you say your giant loves fried chicken, right? <laughs> and your little human body is for this one. <laughs> faced with a giant sized mound of fried chicken for the third time this week. Like, what are you going to do? Like, how are you really going to handle that? And what is everyone else around you going to think about, you know, the fact that all of their chickens are gone now? Like, <laughs> the 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 mechanical balancing of the power of the bone bonnet specifically comes from the narrative weight of their actions. Right? It's why, it's why wizards in the Dresden verse have the laws that they have and why you're not supposed to kill with magic because, my goodness, would it be easy to do? Yeah. You know, um, so you have to let the narrative uh, balance things out and not have the like when when a, a bone bonded enters the field of battle, they're big on purpose because dwarven destroyers are big too, mm-hmm. right? Um, but even dwarven destroyers, which operate at giant scale, the same scale as as humans, which mechanically is two steps up. So they, at the very least get up an additional plus two on their rolls when they are hitting a human scale target, or they get four shifts of effect on the result. If they succeed, like those are some big shots that are coming at you. Um, but because fate is what it is, if you are creating advantages, if you are banking your fate points, a human can take down a dwarven destroyer. Like, it's going to hurt, but it can be done. And so the question of what is it worth it to you to have this power? Like what, what, what sacrifices need to be made for you to bring forth the giant power? That's how you balance the scale is with story and narrative constraints because you're still a person in the world. And maybe your partner doesn't think it's so cool that you have a giant living in your head now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So if, you know, if you bring the giant out one more time, are you going to end up alone? Like, you know, what, what's, what's the power worth? Is the cost worth it? That's sort of the underlying question of the whole thing. Excellent. Yeah, that's great. So I've got one more question. Uh, just shout out to the chat. If you do have anything else, get it in now. So Deanna asks, you've done several Kickstarters over the years. What would you say is the number one thing you've learned over the years back, or sorry, running Kickstarters or being part of Kickstarter? Keep your scope in check. 
<laughs> um, we mentioned that one before. Yes, with 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 a corollary of have the work done before you launch the Kickstarter. Yes. Have another big even if it is an unedited draft, have the first draft of the game, since I mainly do games, have that done. Because um School Days was not totally written when I kickstarted it. One shot was because one shot is short. One shot's like 21 pages long. Mm-hmm. Um, War of Metal and Bone was not written <laughs> when I kickstarted it. Speed's Daughter, the novel, was not written when I kickstarted it. Tales of the Scalds was not written when I kickstarted it. Carthoon was not done when we kickstarted it. Um, these were all bad ideas for various <laughs> reasons because especially if you're running your own Kickstarter, it leaves you in the position of not only having to manage the Kickstarter, which is its own thing, Mm -hmm. but also manage your production team, your editor, your layout artist, your artists, all of that, and you have to write the thing. So you're trying to balance all of those things at the same time, and it's really hard. It's extremely hard, and it can torpedo so many things. Um. So, for example, I've got another project that I'm I'm toying with right now that is a small games anthology, and I've got a Discord server going where people um, who have been interested have been have begun pitching ideas, mm. and all of the terms of what of what the payment will be are already outlined. The dollar amounts are set and they're done and easy. I'm going to be doing the layout for them because I've learned how to do layout over the years. Um, I'm going to be sourcing public domain art for them. So like I'm not paying an artist. These it's it's a lean trim project. The games will be done. I'll have edited them before the Kickstarter launches. And then the Kickstarter will launch and that'll be it. The only stretch goals will be paying all of us more. That's, good. that's it. I mean that that's the whole thing because I have dug holes for myself too many times. Um, there won't be physical copies either because that's another whole thing. Um, I will set it up for print on demand through drive through, but I'm not printing and shipping physical copies myself right. Right. Um, because it's just not, it's, it's, it's too much. There's only um, so much room in your basement for the, <laughs> yeah, well, yes, uh, there is also that. Um, but the interest in this project has been really cool and I want it to be something sustainable and I want it to be like something that benefits everyone who is going to be part of it. So that I think that project is sort of like the encapsulation of what I've learned about doing a Kickstarter because I haven't done one in two or three years now because I've been so gun shy because I don't, I don't want to make the same mistakes again. Um, I'm still trying to fulfill Kickstarters that I did two or three years ago. And that, that feels a way, right? Like I owe people something. I owe people work and I need to get it out to them. And people have been very good and very understanding. And I'm happy about that. But the fact of the matter is I still have that work hanging over my head. So let's not do that again. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for our guest check-in. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like Ironetta and Kickstarter, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you will see this and other topics answered in blog form. Uh, For those of you out there, if you have any questions for us, as we are generally here to answer your game night questions, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Also, if you're interested in being on the show like Tracy, feel free to contact me at mo at tabletopbellhop.com, and I'm sure we can work something out. So how's your energy feeling, Tracy? I think I am going to go to bed. Okay. <laughs> well, Completely you know what? fair. Yeah. It has been a delight to have you here with us tonight, Tracy. Thank you again for joining us. If people are looking, out for, uh, looking for you out there on the interwebs, where is the best place to find you? Uh, so Twitter is where I'm the most active. You can find me there at the other Tracy. Uh, that's T R A C Y. You can also use that same handle for my website, theothertracy.com. Uh, and if you uh, really like what I'm doing, you can uh, support my Patreon at patreon.com/slash/tracybarnett. Um, so uh, yeah, 
say hey. I'd love to chat. All right, and we'll have the links in the show notes. Thank you again very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much for coming out, Tracy. It's been fantastic. Thank you for having me. All right. And now a word from our sponsor. So this last weekend, the entire Tabletop Bellhop crew were at Breakout Con in Toronto, Ontario. Now, for this trip, I only brought two games with me. That was uh, Keyforge, like five, seven decks, if you count the starter decks, and Race for the Galaxy. Now, I brought both of those with me everywhere using a Quiver part playing card case. Now, this worked out great. Uh, I got to say, the Quiver was actually more comfortable strapped over my back than I thought it would be. Like, I actually... Or like a quiver. Um, and I had no problem. Like we we did not stay on site. So we were a little far away. We had a bit of a walk every morning. So I carried it every morning to the con and then had it on me throughout most of the con. I didn't really take it off that often. Now, when I did sit down to play games, everything was still there, snug in its place. I opened it up. Everything still looked great. Uh, it even kept my nice shiny bell safe between games. One of the things that surprised me was how many other people we saw with quivers. Yeah. They were everywhere. I saw them in the board game room, the RPG hall, even people running pickup games in the hotel concourse were using quivers. Yeah, I saw the same thing. Everywhere you looked, there were quivers. Now, I know mine got a lot of attention, too. I would often just have it sitting out on the table. People would come up and ask, take a look at it. Something I was happy to let people do. And everyone that checked it out seemed to be pretty impressed. Now, what I didn't think of, and I should have planned ahead of time, is to have a business card with our discount codes on it. Then I could have handed those out, but I didn't think of it before the con. Speaking of discount codes, we've got a special offer for you for to our listeners and viewers. For the entire month of March, head over to Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, or the QuiverTime websites at QuiverTime.com slash bellhop and use the code DING DING for 10% off the entire line of QuiverTime products. At Amazon.com, though, you'll have to use the code DING 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 because the U.S. is special and needs another ding. That's ding, D-I-N-G. We are growing through the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Uh, Sign up to receive the Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, con wrap-ups, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you will find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now that Breakout Con is done, uh, tune in to our recap episode next week to hear all about that amazing con. We've now got our sights set on Origins in Columbus, Ohio. Now, right right now, I'm not sure if it's just going to be me or Deanna and I. Sadly, I know Sean cannot make it. This year, Origins hits June 12th to 16th, and the Bellhop will be there Wednesday until Sunday. Now, due to being at Breakout Con all weekend, we don't have a Gloomhaven update for you this week, but we should be back on track to play and stream this coming Friday. Remember, you can watch the Bellhop, Deanna, and Kator, pending any wedding plans, cons, or illness, every week at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, every Friday night at Twitch.tv's Tabletop Bellhop. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tabletops. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. Now, last Monday, I had people over and played some Builders of Blankenberg, including a game, checking out the soon-to-be kickstarted expansion, Fields and Flocks. While I played some Cartoon Network deck building. So, I first got to try Builders of Blankenberg way back in May of 2015. Back then, I was approached by Peter Schultz of Cobblestone Games, who asked me if I'd be interested in doing a preview of a prototype game they were working on and planning to kickstart. They'd send me the prototype, I'd check it out, review it, and offer some feedback. In return, they'd send me a production copy of the game once it was published. Now, in Builders of Blankenberg, you're building a medieval town of Blankenberg. Each round, new citizens move into the town looking for places to stay. Each citizen card has three places listed where that person wants to stay in order of preference. 
players are going to collect resources and attempt to build those buildings, hoping they have the buildings that appeal to the most citizens. Buildings aren't very large, though, so most only have space for one or two citizens. To build these buildings, players take part in a resource auction as well as trading in a public market. Now, in addition to points for building buildings and money from attracting citizens, there's also an area control aspect split into the four regions of the city. Events and visitors also add a random element to the game, bringing either positive or negative events and encounters each round. Just a note before I go on, you are rushing a little bit, so you can probably... Okay. Can just, just, uh, uh, so I, you're building the city as a competitive co-op rather than building your own version of the city, and if people like your portion of the city better, you score more? Yeah, I wouldn't. It's not actually a cooperative game, except you are all building the city together. But the goal isn't really to build the city; it's more to build the buildings. So you are building all portions of the city at once, but there is an area majority. So the person who has built the most, say, religious buildings, is going to get an end game bonus. The person who's built the most—I forget the categories now—civic buildings was another one. So whoever's built the most civic buildings is going to get it. But it's all one town, so really, it's it's more of the town is more of a a pacing mechanism. Once all the buildings are built, the game ends. There's really no, you're not cooperating. It's completely competitive. You are trying to make buildings and you are trying to make the buildings that attract to the most people. So now our game on Monday was a five player game and I was reminded just how much I enjoyed this game. Uh, it's not one you ever hear talked about. Like really, I was actually a little worried that the game may feel dated because since the original Kickstarter, I really have not heard any buzz sadly um it didn't feel dated at all like i'll admit it's even been a couple years since i played my copy but i found i still really enjoy it i really like the citizen mechanic um i've mentioned it on the podcast many times on the show that i like games that do something unique and that's hard to find when you own as many games as i have and this one is because the whole row of citizens coming into town each round and trying to figure out which buildings are going to stay at and trying to make sure you build the right buildings um i really dig the way that mechanic works and just the feel of it like it it it's like one of those games where the mechanics seem to tie to the theme. You're building buildings for people to stay at, and there's a stream of people moving into the town, and they're only going to come into the town if the town's appealing to them, so you're trying to make a town that appeals to the citizens. It all kind of ties together in a nice loop. Uh, the other thing I really do dig is I love building that building that's the perfect building that steals one or two citizens away from another player. Uh, that's a fun mechanic. Now, the thing we found when we finished the game is I just kept thinking, man, I got to start bringing this game out again. Like, I I haven't pinned it enough on my end. Uh, not enough people have heard about this game, and I want to share it more. So I think I need to start bringing this out to local gaming events. I got to say, this is one of the biggest hidden gems in my collection that I think really got missed because it's not from any of the big companies. Like, it's not Mayfair, Rio Grande. It was independently published, and I think because of that, everyone just overlooked it as yet another Kickstarter game. Now, my understanding is this game can get quite cutthroat. Is that a feature of the game or more a result of which player count you happen to go with? No, that's definitely a feature of the game. That That is part of the game. Uh, it's all about attracting the citizens to your buildings. And if you can do it so that they're... Like I said, the citizens have three places they want to stay at first, second, third. If you have another player who's built the second building on the list, you want to build the one above so that they now come to your building instead of someone else's. That is definitely the main strategy of the game is really stealing people from the other players. So that is, if you don't like direct conflict like that, you're probably not going to like this game. But it's not really a stab you in the back kind of game. It's not a munchkin feel. It's not a take that game. It's more of a oh, you built the tavern. Well, it looks like the barkeep would rather stay at the inn first. I'm going to make sure to get the inn out of there and steal that. Meanwhile, that other player is probably going to do the exact same thing with your baker who's currently staying at a tavern and would much rather stay at the, the bakery. Right. So what's something you played this last week? Well, the big game for me was Cartoon Network Crossover Crisis combined with the Animation Annihilation Box. Now, this was a twofer that I picked up on Mass Drop, and after opening them up, I immediately just mixed the two games. They're basically the same game, but with two different sets of cartoon shows represented. Now, what I did learn quickly was that I was not as up on my cartoons as I thought I was. Uh, I really only knew about three of the brands in, the, in those boxes. I'd heard of almost all of them, but there were even a couple in there that I had just never even heard of. Um, but it wasn't actually important. 
whether or not you knew each of the cartoons. Just as in the DC deck building, if you had happened to run across a character you don't know, that's fine. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, so this is another Cryptozoic game based on their Cerberus engine. So as a player of the DC game, everything more or less fits what you'd expect. It's heroes versus villains, a five card lineup with, you know, your, your weaknesses and your kicks or whatever they call them, uh, set up on the deck and you draw five cards and play. Everything's pretty much the same. Uh, but that's sort of where things go sideways. Uh, the game really tries, and, and perhaps too hard, to be cartoony. Um, the weakness cards, which in the DC system are just a negative victory point uh, and get in the way. So they're, they're a null card that takes away victory points at the end. In this game, they're all unique effects. Um, and it, they're silly. Um, but they're actually really negative, I found. Um, my son opened the game with a net with a with a weakness card, and almost I felt like he didn't have a chance. Um, wow. And I because I I didn't get a weakness card for till well in the game. Um, the end scoring ended up closer than I expected, but he was feeling well behind the game the whole time. Even though he only ended up a few points behind, uh, he felt behind the wheel the whole time. Um, so there's a lot of party mechanics. There's rock, paper, per scissors, um, fist bumping. <laughs> I could see with, you know, a bunch of people, maybe some grown up drinks or, or a bunch of young kids who don't need the grown up drinks. This could probably be fun. Uh, as a real regular player game, uh, personally, I think it fails. Uh, sorry to hear it. I guess that explains why it was so cheap on Mastro. <laughs> it's odd, though. Like, you're basically throwing in flux mechanics into what should be a serious deck-building game. Like, I think if you're going to go Gonzo, you got to go all the way Gonzo. Instead, they mashed Gonzo into something that's solid. It's it's an odd choice. Yeah, I think I think the branding is, is part of the problem. You know, I mean, you look at this and you think, oh, this is the Cerberus engine. I can mix yeah. this in. I can, I can have, you know, the Powerpuff Girls fight against Superman or fight with Superman. Exactly. And that sounds awesome, but they've done enough different that I would be really hesitant to mix this in with DC. Uh, I, I mean, yes, technically it's possible, but I, I think that would probably ruin DC for me in, in a way. Yeah, I, I can't see, you know, the player playing Batman having to get up and do the chicken dance going over well. <laughs> yep. So back to Bilzers of Blankenberg. Obviously it got funded. I've got the game. So back in 2015... Um, the, the Kickstarter was successful. I did get my copy of the game. Um, I'd like to think my review had something to, to do with that. I did review it very positive. My review was shared on the Kickstarter page. Uh, I have to assume that's why Peter contacted me late last year. And he's like, hey, I got something new. He's like, you still play Builders of Blankenberg? And I'm like, I was honest. I'm like, I have it. I have played it. It's been a little while. I wouldn't mind getting it to the table. He's like, well, I've got something new. I think I'll reinvigorate the game, and I'd like you to check it out. And they're working on a new expansion called Fields and Flux. Now, based on how much I really dig the original game, I'm like, sure, I'll check it out. Plus, working with him was great last year. I didn't have any problem. So after we played the base game, because we, I wanted to refresh myself with the memory, I broke out this new print, almost print-and-play version. This is a prototype. So it's important. Everything I'm talking about right now about Fields and Flocks is a prototype copy of the game. It is not finished at this point. So anything I say here may change by the time it gets on Kickstarter and may change again by the time it gets in people's hands. But we did get to try out this new Fields and Flux prototype. Now, right up, I got to say, we messed things up. We played wrong. Uh, I would say to no far off of our own, the rules are still a work in progress. There was some critical information missing and there was some stuff we completely misunderstood how it was meant to be played. Uh, after the game, I wrote Peter, and I was like, hey, I played it. I don't necessarily want to write up a review yet because it's not going to be overly positive because I see some issues. And literally every single one of my complaints was something we did wrong or something they're already working on addressing. So we've only played once at this point. So we did play some things wrong. So at this point, don't consider this a full review. Like, this is an initial thoughts, right? This is what I've kind of got out of Builders of Blankenberg, Field and Flux so far. Now, I need to play it a few more times. And when I do, I will be doing up a full review, including the proper using, playing by the proper rules. So we've spoken at length about the importance of good rules and rule books. 
hopefully this is this sort of a blind playtest will have the effect of impl- improving that final release for them. I do hope so. Uh, he did also ask me if I was interested in editing the rules for him, and we're talking back and forth on that. That's a, a distinct possibility. Um, so getting to fields and flocks. So the one of the things that adds is a new board, and this expands the original board. So it's a board you put beside the baseboard, which adds more building spots and increases the length of the citizen track. Now, both those things make the game longer. Like you are going to have more rounds in the game because there's now more room to build and more people are going to come visit the city. So that is one thing is an attempt to make the game a little longer because one of the complaints of the original, I guess people have complained that it's too short, that it it feels like you're just getting going and the game ends. And it's got a really long score track. And I got to admit, every game we played, we don't get very far along that score track. (laughs) So it's just a way to, unlike many games where you loop the track by the end of the game, this is like, wow, the score track goes to 40. I got 14. It feels like you're doing something wrong. No, he did make the score track longer with this expansion too. So the other thing this adds to the game is a complete worker placement element of the game. Cause before it was all resource management, drafting and auctions. Now it, adds in one of the more popular mechanics in the world, worker placement. You get a number of serfs. Uh, I think at the beginning, you only get one. You can also win a generic surf that people can win during the auction now. And you're going to use these serfs to tend to your fields and flocks. Now, fields and flocks are represented by cards, currently hobbit-sized cards, and they're acquired by spending silver and using your serfs to get the cards. So you can put a surf out to get a field or put a surf out to get a flock. Uh, there's a spot to get more serfs, and I think there's one other thing you can do with serfs, which I can't remember offhand. I think it's a way to get silver. So you're going to use your serfs to get these cards. Now, when you get the cards, it's going to say like sheep or artox or um, corn or whatever, and it's going to have a water symbol on it. And you're going to take that many water tokens. Then in future turns, you can use your serfs to tend the fields or flocks. And every time you do that, you remove a water token, uh, which leads to some amusing jokes about watering our bees. But as I, we talked about it, like what better would you use that applies to both fields and flocks as a resource than water? So it worked. Like watering your cows works. Watering your fields definitely works. Watering your bees does seem a little odd. Eventually, we came to the conclusion you must be watering the flowers, which the bees are pollinating. But fair enough. You remove water. Once all the water is gone, that field or flock is now ready. Once you have a readied field or flock, you can now use serfs to sell whatever they are to the citizens in town, which was pretty cool. So you're like, now I can sell corn. And on each field or flock, list which citizens are interested in buying that thing. So it ends up that the whatever the baker is interested in the cow because they want to sell milk or whatever it is. And you put a, a, a meeple, a surf on it, and you get some money for selling. The other thing you can do is you can actually attach the fields or flocks to the buildings that have been built in town. Now, the interesting thing with that is you can do them on your buildings or someone else's buildings. So that adds another layer of player interaction. Now, when you do this, you just get prestige. Prestige are points in the game. So it's like, I'm done with this flock. You're never going to be able to do anything with it again. It's a one-time point. Plus, it ties up that surf for the end of the game. So what we saw in our play is early in the game, people are trying to use their fields and flocks to sell the citizens. But by the end of the game, they're attaching them to the various buildings. I dig it so far, but it adds a lot to the game. Like this almost feels like another full mini game put into the game. Just tending fields and flocks and adding worker placement almost feels like like that round of the game is like, okay, we're going to stop playing Builders and Blankenberg for a bit and play fields and flocks for a bit. Then we're going to get back to Builders and Blankenberg. So that makes the game not only longer, but way, like way heavier. Uh, the original Builders of Blankenberg's fairly light. Like there's there's enough to think about. There, it's trying to keep track of the different citizens and things like that. But throwing this in really adds to the cognitive load. And I haven't quite decided if that's a good or a bad thing. Because it definitely steps it up. Now, if you were playing the original thinking, ah, this is a little too light, I'd like more, Fields and Flocks is probably going to be perfect for you. But if you were like, oh, this is nice and quick, and I just build my buildings, and we go and we play a couple rounds every game night instead of just playing one game, it may be a problem. But again, I will repeat, I did play a prototype version, and this is only my first play. I do need to play more. For those that do think this sounds cool, it is expected that it will kickstart in April, and I guarantee my review, full review, will be out before then. Well, we'll look forward to your review when it comes out. So anything else you got to the table this week? Well, I managed a personal best in Libertalia, but that's not saying much, so we'll just leave it at that. (laughs) 
So that's it. Uh, nice short week. Uh, to be honest, it really wasn't that short because we were at Breakout Con, but that'll be next week. Join us here next week. We'll be talking all about Breakout Con. It's probably going to be the full episode. It's just going to be Breakout Con start to finish, probably break away. Like, we'll still do the audience feedback and that. But we're not going to have a question we're answering. It's just going to be all about the con. So that's it for our week. Uh, let's say more shame. More, uh, that came out wrong. That's it for our past week. So uh, less shame, more game. Uh, I do have the Fields and Flocks on the list, even though you can't find it on Board Game Geek yet. So that came off the pile of shame. So we are down one. The pile of shame. Right. So now that we've talked about the games we played, is there anything you are excited to get to the table next week? Well, I'm still hoping to get the Birds of Prey deck into a DC game, but that's the only thing I've got queued up right now. I think you mentioned that one about two weeks ago too. I so did, and it, it never. Day. Yeah, it just it, it just never never happened. So yeah. that's. So obviously, we'll be going over all the games I played at Breakout next week. But besides that, I am looking forward to getting back to Gloomhaven on Friday. Um, also, I'm really looking forward to. There's going to be a game night this Saturday at CG Realm. Though I honestly, excuse me, at this point, have not decided what I'm bringing. So we'll see what that is next week. All right. And now, a quick shout-out and a thank you to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark. Join Phil, Chris, Bob, and Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and games mastering. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks. Joe Swick, thank you. Jeff Seuss, thanks, Jeff. William Fisher, thank you. P.S. Goujon, merci. Danielle Thomas, great seeing you at Breakout. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Andrew Dacey, thanks. And also a quick shout out to our sponsor, Quiver Time. Thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. We can also find us on Board Game Geek under guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. Good night. <laughs>